Hello everyone from the St. John's campus of Memorial University, Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Janet Heron and I am an alumni engagement officer here at Memorial and your host for today's event, our very first MUN Alum 101 of the 2022-23 academic year. I'm here with nature enthusiast, Dr. Gavin Watson, who also happens to be an Associate Vice President, Academic, Teaching and Learning, and the Director of Memorial Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning, and Memorial alumnus, Dr. Jared Clark, uh, Bachelor of Science Honors, 03 and PhD 2010. Together, they're going to be sharing tips and info on bird watching in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, for those of you attending, I know you can't see who else is in the room for the event, but we have a lot of people here right now. We have over 135 registrants and our attendees are growing every second. So we are very happy that you have chosen to spend some time with us today. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the Indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. So at the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on offering many ways for you to connect with Memorial from anywhere in the province, the country, and the world. And we're working diligently to foster opportunities for alumni to celebrate their connections with Memorial and with each other. Mon Alum 101 was born out of the need to reach out to alumni during the first few months of the pandemic. And it has since evolved to become a cornerstone of our alumni engagement activities offering the latest information on key topics from Memorial University's own experts. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships within our Memorial community is vital for our, to our evolution as an institution. So we ask you all to please consider getting involved with our programming. There are opportunities to meet up with uh, expats through Global NL, and our online book club Coastlines features a stellar selection of Newfoundland and Labrador authors, most of whom are Memorial alumni. And you can find out more details on our website, uh, www.mun.ca slash alumni. Just a few housekeeping issues. Uh, a brief Q&A will follow the presentation. Um, I will be monitoring the Q&A function and the chat. You'll find those at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So please try to keep your questions short, and I encourage you to post questions as soon as possible. Try not to leave them to the last minute because we have a full program two presentations and we'll only have limited time to take questions. Um, attendees are not able to unmute your microphone or turn on your video, but you can communicate with other attendees through the chat and you can also enable closed captioning at the bottom left hand side of your screen if that will help you uh, follow along. And please note that at the top, so bottom left, top right, top right hand side of your screen, you should see some layout options uh, so you can customize the appearance of the webinar to whatever suits you best. We are streaming live, but this session is also being recorded and all those who registered will receive a link in the event in a follow-up email. So it is my great pleasure to officially introduce our special guest today. Dr. Gavin Watson studied birders and their birding practices for his doctoral work in environmental education at York University. The results of this work have been reported in the popular press and in journals like Ontario Birds and Environmental Education Research. He has also developed and delivered a popular experiential course on the natural history of Toronto and has led natural history tours across North and Central America. Dr. Jared Clark grew up on the northeast coast of Newfoundland and was introduced to the outdoors by his grandfathers at a very young age. Always a nature enthusiast, he became interested in birds while working for a local conservation group and soon became one of the most avid birders in the province. His love of nature and sharing it with others increasingly led him astray. <laughs> He currently runs a small bird and nature tour business called Bird the Rock and routinely leads trips at home and abroad for various tour companies. 
So first we're going to hear from Dr. Watson and I will upload his presentation and then give him the presenter duties. Thanks, Janet. Uh, as I'm being given presenter duties, I want to say uh, thanks to uh, alumni for the opportunity to come and have a conversation about birders and birding. I also want to say thanks to Jared, and I look forward to seeing his presentation a little bit later. I've seen a preview of the slides, and I know it's going to be great. I think we're going to be a, a wonderful one-two punch. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my doctoral research, so I'm going to probably be a bit more academic. Um, I promise I won't be alienating. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the practices that uh, I saw during my uh, doctoral work uh, that helps define uh, what birding is. Um, and I think it'll it'll tie nicely into Jared's uh, presentation where uh, he's going to talk in a lot more concrete details about the kinds of places and spaces within the province of Newfoundland and Labrador that you can um, see birds. So I hope together we're a, a wonderful uh, one-two punch. So like Janet mentioned, my name is Gavin Watson, uh, and it's a, a pleasure to uh, be with you today. Um, over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to quickly orient you to the nature of my doctoral work, and I'm going to share a very treetop levels, like a hawk skimming over the top of the boreal forest, um, two uh, broad outlines of my work, one on the practices of field birding, and um, as it relates to environmental education, how birding can be a way of coming to know the natural world. So let's jive right in. Um, I grew up in a family of birders. You, I'm sure, can pick me out uh, from the uh, photos there. Uh, I got to go birding with my uh, maternal grandparents, um, and uh, I was brought along. I must admit um, that over time, I, I have an affinity for birding, but that the, uh, when I was younger, I was brought along and was kind of forced to, to go. Um, and what that really did for me was force me to watch birders watching birds. And if there was a nucleus for my interest in, in, in birding as a practice, it's probably from my experience as a kid. Uh, the truth is that uh, I'm all grown up now with kids of my own. And so um, even though this is an area of uh, focus for me in my research, it's still also a, an area of extreme joy as well. Um, these photos were taken a couple years ago. My uh, two kids are a little bit older um, and less and uh, less likely to want to come with me birding uh, these days. But let's start with asking the big question about who's a birder. And this is a really important question because um, it uh, will help shape what we focus on and, and what, in fact, what I what I um, uh, researched in my uh, doctoral work. I think it's important to say that my uh, this work is qualitative in nature, which means that um, I'm not reporting a singular truth, and it's definitely contextual to the folks that I interviewed and uh, the places that I went. So my research was based in Ontario. A lot of the stories that I'm going to be telling you today are about a place called uh, Rondeau Provincial Park, which is a uh, peninsula of sand that's jutting into Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes. There's a reason why I went there, and now you'll hear that in a little bit. Uh, and um, the other thing is I'll tell I'll I'll be quoting some folks that I interviewed. Um, I'll be giving them names, but you need to know that all of this work went through ethics approval, and the names that I've given my research uh, participants are not their real names, but I've given them names so that I can refer to them uh, in a real way rather than research participant one. So. Um, a definition for birders is that uh, it's provided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they define uh, a birder as any individual who has either taken a trip of one mile, so 1.62 kilometers or more from the home, for the primary purpose of observing birds and uh, or uh, uh, closely observing or attempting to observe birds around the home. And so, you know, I, I agree with that definition, but I think it needs to be expanded a little more. Um, my experience as a birder suggests that uh, birders are always searching for wild birds. That means non-domesticated birds. So while that may be obvious for most, it does mean that like bird pets at home or escaped birds from aviaries are not typically included in the rough understanding of um, what, can be, uh, what can be part of birding. Um, I'm specifically talking about one kind of birding today that's called that I define as field birding, and that's the act of traveling from a home to a location 
to identify birds to species. Um, I also had a look at different kinds of birding than my doctoral work. I looked at people that um, uh, fed and observed birds in their backyards. And then I also uh, spoke with uh, folks that rescued birds um, who had crashed into uh, large buildings in downtown Toronto. Um, and um, uh, that what one of the things that sort of uh, uh, drove my entire interest, obviously, not only was my personal experience with birding, but the observation that uh, over time, and especially in the uh, in the last 20 years, there's been a huge growth in uh, recreational uh, nature recreation. Um, and uh, birding as an activity has exploded. Uh, when I was doing my work, it was uh, it was the most popular recreational activity in the United States, for example. But um, there's a tension there, and that is that, that uh, over the same time and even preceding that, we've seen a, a decrease in the absolute number of birds and a decrease in the number of species of birds. So we have this two um, this tension between this this growth in interest in birding and then this collapse of of bird numbers and bird species. So. Um, my central research question was, how do the various practices of birding shape birders' perspectives and relationships to the natural world? As an environmental educator, my assumption was uh, that uh, birders do make a connection to the natural world, and so I wanted to explore that. So now I'm going to switch into talking about uh, those two uh, high-level uh, findings um, related to field birding that I, that I was planning on sharing with you today. So uh, birding uh, is at some level about um, the act of collecting personal observations of bird species. Uh, and if that's the case, there's actually some kinds of birds that hold more power over birders than others. So um, when the presence of such a bird is reported, an interesting field birder will spend considerable effort to see the bird, for example, traveling hours to get to the bird's observed location. Um, this happened most recently this year in this province where we had a um, species of sea eagle um, that was seen in the Trinity area. I mean, it was actually seen off of the East Coast Trail, but found in the Trinity area. And um, people were traveling um, to get on a boat uh, or hike through the bush to get to the point where they could see um, see those uh, see that bird. So, when observed by birders, um, the sea eagle, for example, or these birds, generally speaking, can elicit an emotional reaction, stoke a sense of accomplishment, and be the source of catharsis after days, weeks, or even months of searching. So, when you arrive at a Rondo Provincial Park and you pay your entrance fees, you're handed a tabloid-sized newspaper about the park. In it, um, you'll find a photograph, and the photograph is the uh, a photograph quite similar to the one that I posted here, um, which is a, a picture of a male prothonotary warbler, um, about 13 centimeters long. These birds are found in regularity at Rondeau Provincial Park and not in other places in southern Ontario, and so they've become the unofficial mascot for the park. Darren, a birder who visits the park on a regular basis from the city about an hour and a half away, describes why the species is a high point for birding at Rondeau. He told me that it's, uh, yeah, it's because your chances of seeing a prothonotary are so restricted. You don't see it here, you're not going to see it anywhere. That's not literally true, but it's that type of thing. Whereas uh, we see the red-headed woodpecker today, for instance, and we usually see it here. But we know that we can see it in other places. So it's slightly down that. And then there's the red-winged blackbirds. God, we've got them all over the place. And then you get down to the house sparrow. We see them every day. So it's the level of expectancy or the probability that's a bit more interesting to see something where the odds are against you. So the prothonotary warbler is a sought-out bird because it's so difficult to find elsewhere. But it's also not rare birds that have powers. Uh, there's also birds uh, that are extremely aesthetically pleasing uh, that also draw people's attention. So in speaking with uh, David, who's an advanced birder with lots of years of experience at Rondeau, I asked him if there was one bird that still excites him uh, when he sees it. And he said to me, well, I guess we're getting into the category where you say, have you seen any good birds today? And the diehards, well, they'll say all birds are good. But of course, at Rondo, I think it has to be the prothonotary warbler. People come from all over the world to stand on that boardwalk and look at that bird. But for my wife and I, we've always had kind of a passion for a Blackburnian. 
And as a quick aside, out of uh, David's voice, this is an image of a Blackburnian warbler that I've posted down below. A uh, Blackburnian warbler, because we have a photograph of one of the old employees uh, at Peely made at one time. We had it blown up on the large, and it's a gorgeous picture. And we've always been color conscious. So uh, one of the findings of my work was that desirable birds are not just rare or beautiful. They're often some combination of both characteristics. But for birders, um, these characteristics combine to create the most desirable bird species to see, species that have the power to attract, um, such as the rare and beautiful prothonotary warbler at Rondo. And that draws birders from all over the world. Now I'm gonna uh, talk about, and I'm just checking my time, I've got, I'm, I'm okay here. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about uh, how birding can be a, a way of connecting to the natural world and a way of knowing the natural world. So uh, let me just take a quick drink of water here so I can get through the next little bit. So uh, birds generally believe um, that their actions, excuse me, birders generally believe that their actions foster a connection to the birds that they see. Um, and um, my uh, respondents suggested that birding is a deeply pleasurable experience. And, and this pleasure, I theorize, comes from two related factors. The first is the sensory experience of identifying birds and the excitement felt from seeing birds. So. Um, identifying and seeing birds is a sensual act, and I mean by it uses our senses. Um, and so Sherry, um, one of my uh, uh, interviewees said, well, you know, I love that birding involves all the senses, you know, your aesthetic senses, you know, your sight and sound and your ability to observe and also the sound and hearing. So uh, as birds become more sensually engaged with the world, they see birds, but then they start hearing birds and they notice them in different places. Uh, identification becomes easier and they start to be able to identify birds through gestalt. So just like they can see the shape of a bird moving through the, 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 the field of view of their binoculars. And, you know, rather than collecting discrete uh, bits and pieces of what that bird is, they just kind of know right away um, what that bird is. And so um, th that's, that capacity, that, that learning is, is grown through a sense of discovery and openness to the world. And that in turn, uh, encourages birders to keep looking and listening. There's a there's a feedback loop there. Um, in that feedback loop also is a sense of excitement that comes from detecting and then successfully seeing a bird. So in short, seeing birds feels good. Identifying individuals to species provides a sense of accomplishment and the pleasure of watching birds can expand into an awareness of the living and non-living contexts that are necessary for birds continuing existence. Um, so in this way, uh, in my work, I suggested that it became a practice of not just birding, but actually coming to know the natural world, kind of like natural history. So um, it appears then that beyond uh, learning to identify wild birds, being interested in watching birds facilitates an awareness of the larger environmental context surrounding the practice. Barbara uh, described this openness to the other uh, noticings uh, while they were out birding to me. Uh, she said, but even if we go up and we don't see a lot of birds, if we don't see any birds, we get to notice everything else. I've now got an interest in butterflies, wildflowers and fauna and that sort of thing because you get to notice as you're standing around waiting for birds, you can't help but notice everything that's going on. So um, this ecological awareness can be even used to assist with the act of identification where knowledge of habitats can um, come together to help a bird or narrow down the possible identities of a sighting. And remember that birding is all about identifying a bird to species. So uh, it's clear um, from my results that birding, um, in addition to being an economic stimulus or a form of leisure, is a kind of environmental learning. Uh, birders engage with their immediate environment and a birder's presence appears to be a catalyst for making the rest of the outdoor outdoors more meaningful for birders. Um, knowledge about birds is always generated in place in relationship with other living and non-living parts of the environment. So um, it's clear to me that uh, the larger context that a bird is found, the, its environment, it, it, its ecology is a, uh, can play a part uh, in the identification. Uh, and um, 
I reflected on that one evening um, where I was out looking at shorebirds um, in a man-made uh, water uh, uh, water feature. Uh, and um, I wrote as I drove back that, uh, so this is an excerpt from my um, field notes, um, which was one of the ways that I collected data during my research. Um, as we drove back to Rondeau, um, I and the two other people that I was birding with, we talked a little bit about identifying shorebirds. What struck me was that the identification was a combination of visual cues uh, and observed behavior. So David, one of my uh, birding companions, suggested that the Baird sandpipers, these birds that I've got a photo of here, prefer to be further back from the water's edge rather than right in it. And that the identification um, I observed was often a synergy between uh, visual cues and observed behavior rather than just one or the other. So identification, uh, rather than simply attempting to match an impression of a bird to an image in a bird book, uh, becomes more a uh, complex act with experience. Uh, and that larger uh, context is a combination of many different things. It's habitat, previous experience, bird behavior, even time of year. So awareness of these factors is awareness of ecological context, and what's really important um, is by that, I mean the relations of organisms to each other and their surroundings. So that doesn't exclude humans, and it focuses on the larger relationships between the bird, the human, the organism, and the space where they're found. So birding, in my mind, can be a multisensory activity that attracts participants through its birding nature, uh, through its visual nature. Uh, and it's more complicated than strictly being an activity of seeing birds. Um, as a birder's attention turns toward the presence of birds, birders begin to watch birds. Watching is an active choice on the part of a birder to pay attention and select a higher quality of engagement with the birds they see. And this quality of engagement has implications for the practice of birding. Bird observations can turn to identification, uh, and in turn, they can uh, connect to uh, the larger environment that the birds are seen. So in conclusion, and uh, before I finish, I, I titled the name of this talk, uh, The Joy of Birding. Uh, and so I'm certainly saying that the act of ID identification takes um, senses, ecological context into consideration and helps fix an identity. Uh, and that birders through identification and time in the field become uh, more aware of the larger ecological context of the act. There's a joy in that. But there's a tension, and my research ended with a question, and that is, does that ecological awareness um, lead to a, a change in behavior? I wasn't able to answer this, but I often reflect on this as I look at other birders and, and consider my own actions myself when I'm out in the field. Um, am I more likely or are my birding friends more likely to uh, undertake behaviors or engage um, in make decisions that are likely to reverse the decline in species or increase the number of absolute individuals? And to be honest, I don't quite have an answer for that yet. Um, and it's part of uh, my own personal reflections. And so if and as you engage in birding in the backyard as, as somebody that feeds birds and attracts them in or travels places, I want you to consider the, those lives of those birds that you see in front of you, where they've come from, where they go to, and, and what kind of decisions that we can make um, as uh, part of that ecological context that we can ensure that um, not only Will our grandparents or parents before us have had the opportunities to see those birds, but our children and our children's children will have that opportunity to have the same kind of relationships that we've had. Thanks. I'm going to throw it back to you, um, Janet, to pass on the presentation to Jared. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson. So now I'm going to give the wait first. I'm going to load up Gavin, uh, not Gavin's, Jared's presentation. One second. Hold on. Alrighty, and now over to Dr. Clark. Excellent. Well, thank you first to uh, to Janet and to Gavin for inviting me to uh, to join you guys on this fun presentation today. And uh, boy, it's hard it's hard for me to move on to my own presentation when Gavin just left me with a whole bunch of uh, nuggets that I would love to sort of chat about further. There are so many things there that relate to 
my own experience as a birder, but also my experience within the birding community and lots of really sort of interesting takeaways there that could, uh, could stem a lot of really interesting conversations, I think. Um, but what you've asked me to do to come here today is to talk a little bit about birds and birding in a, in a, in a Newfoundland context. And just, uh, I'm going to give a, a brief overview sort of, of why I think that Newfoundland and Labrador is such an incredible place for birds and birding. Um, and, uh, a brief look at, at sort of the diversity of birds that you might expect to see here if you were uh, to spend some time looking for them. So this slide is probably a little unnecessary as I think most people on this call would be very familiar with the, with, with the province of Newfoundland and Labrador and most of you are probably somewhere within this map at the moment actually. Um, but I just wanted to include this just as a uh, just a little bit of a reminder of one our unique position um, geographically within Canada and and within North America, um, as well as a reminder of just how big a province and how diverse uh, we are, how how diverse a natural world we have in the province. And those things are important because um, our sort of unique location at Canada's northeast, at the very northeastern corner, in lots of ways of uh, of North America um, sort of makes us, gives us a real unique mix of birds. Um, we have things, you know, coastal birds because we're, we're way out here on the East Coast. We have more northerly birds because we're, we're fairly far north and into the boreal range. Um, so we have this real unique mix of, of birds that live or pass through Newfoundland and Labrador in the run of a year um, that you, you can't sort of see all together in any one place. We are sort of unique in that way. Um, and because our seasons change so much, so does the do, do the birds. So uh, we have a real great mix of birds, and we have a real never-ending variety as the seasons change throughout the year. So birding, um, going out and exploring nature here in this province, um, it's a very different place every month of the year if you were to go out. Um, I don't know if people would realize it or not, but there are nearly 250 species of birds that either live in or pass through Newfoundland and Labrador every year um, that you should could sort of reliably expect to be found in the province every year. Um, and if you throw in all the birds that sort of show up as, as, as rare visitors that don't normally occur here, there have been more than 400 species of birds recorded in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so that's, that's pretty incredible, actually, when you consider um, the size of the province. So if Newfoundland is a fantastic place for birds, it sort of makes sense that it would also be a fantastic place for birding. Not always true. Uh, those things don't always necessarily go hand in hand. Um, but in this case, it is true. Um, because we have, in lots of ways, very accessible nature here. We have lots of nature, uh, lots of green space, but a lot of it is also very accessible. Um, it makes it a great place both for the birds and for the birders who like to go out and find those birds. Um, and that's true whether you're a local birder, someone who lives here and has the uh, the great pleasure of being able to go out exploring nature uh, in your own backyard here, um, or if you're a visiting birder, like one of the many tourists that I'm fortunate to be able to host and, and to share this beautiful place with every year. Uh, we have a real array of different habitats um, across the province, um, very diverse bird life, and a lot of the species are birds that would be considered tough to see. Um, in most of the rest of North America. Um, so there are a lot, we have a lot of these sort of like these high value species as, as Gavin was just talking about birds that, that are, that are kind of tough to see in other places, um, that are pretty readily available here in this province and, and are a bit of an allure, um, for visiting birders, especially. And if you're one of us folks who are, uh, already living here, it's a place that just never ceases to amaze. And no matter how many years I get to live in Newfoundland and to go birding, um, here. Um, I don't think I'll ever stop learning. I'll never stop seeing new things. Um, so it's just an incredible place to be able to do that as a local. Of course, you can't talk about Newfoundland and Labrador and birds without talking about seabirds, right? It's, uh, it's something that uh, I think we've, we're famous for on a world scale, uh, both in and out of the, the bird watching community. Um, and that's for good reason. We are home um, to some of the world's most spectacular, certainly, and just as importantly, uh, accessible seabird colonies. Um, there we, we have some of, the, some of the world's largest seabird colonies, some of the most diverse seabird colonies in the world. 
Um, and a lot of them are, you, you can get to relatively easily compared to seabird colonies and lots of the other places of the world. Um, and some days, if you were to go out exploring along the coast, you can see more than a dozen of uh, seabird species that are pretty sought after around the world. And you can do that in a matter of just a couple of hours in some places like the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve. Of course, our most famous seabird is the Atlantic puffin. It's our provincial bird for good reason. Um, we have the largest breeding population of this species in uh, North America. Uh, the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve is home to the, to, the, to the largest single colony in North America and the second largest in the entire world. Um, and it's such an endearing bird. Um, it's, it's, it's fun to watch. It's a little comical looking. Um, it's very beautiful. Uh, so it, it definitely is an icon for Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's a bird that uh, whether you're someone who lives here or someone who's coming from away to see birds, it's always sort of high on the list of birds that people want to see. And another one of our famous seabirds is the, is the northern gannet, um, much, much larger than the puffin. And probably that's part of the reason that makes it uh, so well liked. It's very majestic with a six foot wingspan, that beautiful golden head on a, on a stark black and white body. Um, it is elegance on, on the wing for sure. It is an absolutely beautiful bird um, that can be seen um, all across Newfoundland and Labrador uh, around the coast during the summer months. Um, so another very beautiful and very famous bird that is um, that is quite easy to see here and a little bit of a tough bird to find in many other parts of even eastern North America. But we have, you know, at least a dozen other breeding seabirds um, that, that breed around our coast in the summer months. Um, and they range from the, you know, the, the small um, black-legged kittiwake, a small seagull that you see here in the, in the left side of the, the top left side of the, uh, the screen to the largest seagull in the world, the great blackback, or as many Newfoundlanders would know it, a saddleback. Um, so we have a number of species of gulls. We have uh, two species of myrrh, thick-billed and common myrrh. We have a couple of species of what we call tube noses, the northern fulmar here in the bottom left, and there in the bottom center, uh, we have the largest colonies of leeches storm petrel, a very small little seabird, uh, but also very abundant um, in our province. And things like great cormorant, which are, uh, again, a species that's sort of very uh, typical of, of the northeast part of North America, but tough to see anywhere else. So we have a whole incredible diverse um, group of breeding seabirds that are here during the summer months um, and are always a big draw for folks who, who want to come to visit here. And we're very lucky to have those birds on our shore. It's, a, it's an incredible thing to be able to go out on a regular basis and see these birds on a daily basis. And you can see these birds along our shore. If you're out boat fishing, if you're just hiking along the East Coast Trail, you get to see a lot of these birds. Um, but the most spectacular way to see these birds, um, and part of what makes us such a special place, is to see them at their breeding colonies. Um, where they gather usually in huge numbers, sometimes mind-boggling numbers. Um, and this map just shows um, a few of the more well-known and the larger seabird colonies around our coast. Um, and you'll notice that we've done a pretty good job as a province of actually protecting these seabird colonies. Most of what you see there are uh, designated ecological reserves with lots of protections in place to make sure that, uh, that these birds have a safe and protected place to spend their summer months. Um, so. That's one thing that we're very lucky about here is, is we do have a, a, a very um, good protection and parks program, reserve program. Um, some of these seabird colonies are very accessible. The Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve, even though you have to go out uh, in, in a boat to enjoy it, we have a number of uh, commercial boat tours that can take you out there. And it's just an incredible experience if you've never done it yourself. As I mentioned, that colony is the, uh, is the world's the second largest um, Atlantic puffin colony with more than a half a million puffins in that colony alone. Um, Cape St. Mary's is an absolutely stunning landscape with this gorgeous um, northern gannet colony that you can see here uh, in the photo where the, my daughter is standing in front of the, the colony there. Um, and that's accessible by land, just a short hike. And you can enjoy this without having to 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 go miles out to sea or to take a boat or, you know, to hike incredible distances. It's very, very accessible on a world scale. Um, 
and places like Bonavista and Ellison are becoming more and more popular with with birders, both locals and visitors, um, as a place to go and see some of our breeding seabirds, especially the puffins. So we're very lucky here to have all of these protected, accessible, beautiful, spectacular seabird colonies. Um, and that is definitely one of the things that makes um, Newfoundland and Labrador so special um, from a birding perspective. And that's not to say that all of the seabirds that we see here are birds that breed here. There are a number of seabirds that we get to see in Newfoundland and Labrador every year um, that are not ones that can be found at the colonies because they don't breed here. So for example, some of the additional species that show up in mid to late summer are the shearwaters. Uh, a lot of Newfoundlanders would know them as hagdowns or box or skirwinks, depending on what part of the island you come from. Um, and several of these species actually breed in the southern hemisphere during our winter. Um, so their seasons are reversed from ours. They breed in the southern hemisphere and they fly all the way to Newfoundland during our summer months, um, following the food, much like the, the whales do. Uh, so they come here to enjoy the, the capelin and the other the other ocean delicacies that birds enjoy so much, often in huge numbers. And these are birds that um, would be very familiar to anyone who spends a lot of time on the ocean in boat uh, because they are what we call pelagic species. They spend most of their time far out. Um, but one of the really neat things about Newfoundland and Labrador is that for part of the summer when the capelin are in close to shore, we can see these birds um, from land. You can go places like the headlands of Cape Race, Cape Spear, Cape St. Mary's and see huge numbers sometimes of these birds um, from solid land. And there are actually very few places in the world that can say that. Um, it's very, very difficult to be able to see these birds from land. And in most places, um, especially in the rest of North America, if birders want to see these birds, they have to get in, in a boat and often go for hours way out into the, into deep waters of the ocean in order to find these. So we're blessed actually to have these birds um, right at our doorstep for much of the summer. Some of the other seabirds that show up here uh, during migration that, that, that are not local breeders, uh, things like great skuas and yaggers, as you see here. Um, but even um, sand, there are certain species of sandpiper, the phalaropes, which are unique in the sandpiper world. They're very tiny little birds. Um, and you think of sandpipers as being just that, something that, that sort of forages on a beach. But there are a couple of species of sandpipers, the, the, the red and red-necked phalaropes that migrate along the coast of Newfoundland and do so on the ocean. And during the late summer, you can actually see little flocks of these birds sitting on the ocean um, doing things that you just don't expect um, shorebirds or sandpipers to be doing. Um, so there's a whole sort of a unique world out there of seabirds, uh, both breeding and non-breeding. That, uh, that we have here. And it is, it is a very unique situation that we have in Newfoundland, unlike anywhere in the world, actually, um, both in the diversity of the species that you can see and how easy it is to see some of them. So it's pretty special. So it's really easy to get lost among the seabirds when we're, we're out birding in Newfoundland or when we're talking about birds in Newfoundland because the seabirds are such a big part of our, uh, of our ecosystem here. Um, but there are so many other birds that we can see here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, we've got a big diverse province and there's a whole bunch of different habitats to explore. Um, and with each different habitat, um, you find a whole different suite of birds, wildlife and other natural highlights to enjoy. Um, so there's a whole world of birds out there uh, that don't live out on the ocean that we can be exploring. Um, and if you think about the fact that I, I mentioned earlier that they're in a year, there are roughly about 250 species that, that live in or pass through Newfoundland and Labrador. And, you know, if 25 of those are seabirds, well, that leaves well over 200 still that are, that are land-based um, birds that, uh, that we have an opportunity to see. So it's a, it's a pretty rich place for uh, land-based birding as well as seabirding. I just want to speak briefly about some of those different habitats and the diversity of birds that we find in them. Um, all of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, our forests are all within what we call the boreal forest range. Um, and you'll often hear scientists and, and, and biologists speak of the boreal forest as, as the world's nursery. It's where the, the biggest number of songbirds breed during the summer months. A lot of them are migratory. They come north from, you know, more southerly parts of North America, even from South America. They fly north in the spring spend their summer breeding in our beautiful boreal forests and then migrate back south. 
and a lot of other ones are resident and live here year round. But in any case, our forests are, are pretty full of birds, especially during the summer months. Um, boreal forests are, are a northern forest, so we have a very decidedly northern flavor to the birds that you find in our forests. Uh, but we also have very rich forests here, a lot of sort of untouched, a lot of um, protected green space. And a lot of it, again, much like the seabird colony, is very accessible. Lots of parks, lots of great hiking trails that give us access to um, to the forests, and a lot of forest that is public land. It's not privately owned, so lots of places to go exploring. So we're very, very fortunate in the province to have that. And not all places um, are fortunate enough to be able to say that. So we have a number of of birds um, that you can expect to see from a, from a whole bunch of different bird families. We have the, of course, the warblers are always a, a favorite that come here in the summers. The more colorful birds. Um, very colorful, great songs, beautiful to look at, beautiful to listen to. Um, and we have a diverse number of those that breed in the forest across Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, but they're only here during the summer and they are migratory birds that spend their the rest of their year in Central or South America for the most part. Um, but we have a lot of uh, birds that also come from the north. So we have finches that uh, are often breeding further north than Newfoundland, um, maybe even further north than parts of Labrador. Um, and a lot of those come south in the winter. Um, and we get to see these, these amazing finches that spend their mostly the winter months um, with us in Newfoundland and Labrador, enjoying the cone crops in our, in our beautiful forests. Uh, resident birds like the Canada jay or the gray jay, as most people would know it, um, boreal chickadees, these really resident boreal species that are, that are a little bit tougher and can, can live here year round. They're here for the nice summers. They're also here for the hard winters. Um, which is pretty special. And these are birds that because they're so tough, they're generally northerly birds in, you know, they are found only in the boreal forests. Um, so for the majority of birders in North America, it's not something they can expect to find close to home. And uh, it's part of the reason that birders from the United States and other parts of Canada will travel to places like Newfoundland or, or, or other parts of the, of the country where there are northern boreal forests just to see some of these birds that we take for granted as everyday backyard birds. Um, but they are, they're one of some of those birds, as, as Gavin mentioned, that they're, they're tough to see. They are, they're sort of high value because of that. Um, but they're, they're very common. They're part of our, our year, year round, uh, bird life here. Uh, so always very special to see even things like spruce grouse. You can see a picture here of a, a spruce grouse in full display that, uh, that's a bird that can be found in the, in the forests of central and western Newfoundland. Um, so just some incredible birds that can be found in the forest. And as I mentioned, we have lots of uh, amazing places to go exploring the forest. Of course, we have so much boreal forest in Newfoundland that if you are if you happen to be tuning in from somewhere here on the island, then I can guarantee that uh, you can go out your the front door of your office or your house, wherever you happen to be right now, and walk. And within five minutes, you're somewhere in the forest. We're so lucky to have so much green space around us in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, there are some obvious places, you know, that some of the... the National parks like Gros Morne, Terra Nova, um, all of our provincial parks provide excellent access to a diversity of forests. Um, and I want to point out something that, that I think is important and, and maybe people don't think about in this province um, is that if you've been in one forest, you've only been in one forest. The forests across New Newfoundland and Labrador, even though um, they're all considered boreal forests, they're all very different. Um, and the the there's a big change in the forest as you go from east to west, especially across Newf Newfoundland. Um, so the boreal forest that you find, for example, here on the Avalon Peninsula, where I am at the moment, um, are very different in lots of ways than the boreal forest that you'll find on the west coast in places like the Gross Grossmore National Park. And even that is different than the boreal forest you'll find a little further south in the Conroy Valley. Um, the forests in western Newfoundland are more diverse. They have more species of trees more hardwoods compared to the, the almost complete softwood forests of the Avalon Peninsula. So as the forest type changes, so does the, the bird life that lives within it. You get a different diversity of birds in Gross Warren or the Codroy Valley than you will in central Newfoundland than you will in the Avalon Peninsula. Um, so even as someone, a local birder who lives in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, it's amazing just to go birding in different places across the island. You get to see a whole different suite of birds. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty fun and it's a great reason to, uh, to sort of get out there and explore more of our own province because there's always something different to see.
I bet wherever you are now too in Newfoundland uh, and Labrador, you could also leave your house and within five minutes be within a wetland because we have an awful lot of wetlands um, in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, whether that's local ponds or streams and rivers, bogs. We certainly have lots of bogs, uh, coastal estuaries. We have tons of different kinds of wetlands and we have lots of it. Um, and wetlands are home to a whole different suite of birds. Um, some incredible birds and, and quite, a, quite a great diversity of things like waterfowl, different types of ducks, um, herons like the American bittern pictured here in the top right of the, the, uh, the screen, shorebirds, loons, uh, all kinds of neat birds that you can find by going exploring in wetlands. Um, I give a lot of uh, talks in the last couple of years, especially during COVID, to, uh, to school kids. And uh, that's one of the things that I keep pushing on them is that, you know, the amazing thing about nature is that, you know, habitats are so close together and, you know, you can be, you can be in a, in a deep boreal forest here and five minutes later, you can be in a wetland and see a completely different set of wildlife and how lucky we are to live in a place where we can do that. And we do, we have lots of very accessible wetlands again, because of our, our, our great trail systems, our great parks. Um, we have some really special wetlands, like for example, the, uh, the Codroy Valley estuary, it's the only Ramsar site, um, on the Southwest of, of Newfoundland. It's an incredible wetland area, um, of world significance. And there's, uh, there's lots of amazing nature there, not just birds, but, but certainly lots of really cool birds that are, you can see in the Codroy Valley that are sort of tough to see anywhere else in Newfoundland, let alone, um, other parts of, of Canada. So get out there and explore some of those wetlands. I think they're, they're places that we tend to overlook because they're so ubiquitous around us and lots of them look kind of boring. You're driving past a, a roadside bog and it doesn't look that exciting. But to believe me, sir, there's some really interesting uh, wildlife and birds that uh, call those wetlands home. Uh, coastal barrens and subarctic tundra. We have lots of really cool tundra and, and barren type birds. Um, whether it's owls or ptarmigan or different types of shorebirds that migrate through there, um, some really unique habitats. Some of the really cool places like the hyperoceanic barrens that you can find at Cape St. Mary's, the, the southern tips of the Avalon, Cape Bonavista, or the more subalpine tundra at the tops of the Long Range Mountains in Gross Morn. Some really, really neat habitats with some very special birds that live there um, and really neat places to go exploring. And as Gavin sort of mentioned, um, you know, one of the great things about birding is often not the birds. It's the other things that you discover along the way and the other um, aspects of nature that we that we grow to, to love and appreciate. Um, so mostly I've been talking about summer, but the in-between times are really important too. We get lots of really neat migration periods in Newfoundland, and one of those is late summer. Um, so like now, uh, August and September is a time when all of these shorebirds that breed in the Arctic are migrating through our province. It's a great time to get out there and go birding along the beaches and the bays, um, looking for this, you know, incredible diversity of sandpipers and plovers um, that, that move through our province for a very short window during this time of year. And this is our one chance to see them. And you can see more than 20 different species of, of shorebirds um, here. And it's a really great thing to do in late summer when many of the other aspects of birding uh, have sort of quieted down after a busy breeding season. And winter is probably our best kept secret. Um, you know, getting out there in winter and seeing the whole, a whole different set of birds that arrive here in winter that we don't get to see at other times of the year. Things like snowy owls and bohemian waxwings, waterfowl that have, that are wintering here. Um, all these neat birds that uh, are only here during the coldest months, um, makes it a great reason to get out and go exploring during the winter. And a lot of these birds are really attractive to birders visiting from other parts of North America because they're really, really difficult to see in lots of other places um, because this is, is what they consider south. Uh, these, a lot of these are birds that just don't go much further south than here, so they barely ever show up in places like the United States. Uh, so for those who don't mind the cold, uh, winter birding in Newfoundland and Labrador can be extremely rewarding. And finally, um, I want to point out that because we're the closest part of the continent to Europe, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, we often get wayward visitors from across the Atlantic, European species that get a little bit lost on migration um, and show up in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and these are very rare visitors to any part of North America. So they can be very exciting uh, to spot. We get them on a fairly regular basis um, in this province, which makes us sort of special. 
And it's not that unusual for birders from across Canada or the United States to sort of drop everything um, and catch the next flight to Newfoundland and Labrador to see some of these really rare species. And that sort of, again, is one of the aspects, the rarity aspect of birding that, that Gavin alluded to earlier. So it's another part of, of sort of Newfoundland that makes us a very, uh, a very, very special place for birds and birding. So I hope that was a, a, a good little overview. I know that there's going to be lots of questions. Um, so I want to thank you. And I'm just going to leave this slide up for a second. It has uh, my website and my various social media things. If you're interested in contacting me or following along on some of my adventures, feel free to take your phone now and get a screenshot of this and you can look me up. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you, Gavin. That was so interesting. I tell you, it's it's wonderful that you've been able to share your experience with all of us. Um, I'm just going to take the controls back from Jared and we can include, we'll include um, these links to uh, Jared's sites, uh, social media sites in the follow-up email as well. Um, so I'm just going to take that back. And before we go directly into the questions, uh, we have had some questions already on the uh, in the chat and the Q and A. Uh, just before we're going to do that, uh, we're just going to do a quick little advertisement for Johnson Insurance. Uh, we love Johnson Insurance, and Johnson offers Memorial University alumni specially designed policies and preferred rates on home and auto insurance, as well as travel insurance. So there is a number there, and it's also there's some information on our website. And um, you should definitely look into that. Um, so now we go to our questions. And we do have a specific question for Jared. Um, uh, Kevin was asking, is of the 250 species of birds that can be seen here in Newfoundland, is there a sense of how many birds live here in Newfoundland and Labrador versus how many pass through? Um, for sure there is. Uh, I don't know if I'd know that number offhand. Um, it wouldn't take that long to sort of figure out, you know, we have, there's lots of, we have a pretty good idea of what, which birds breed in Newfoundland and Labrador. I guess if you want to use that as your, your sort of, your definition of living here, even many of those are fairly migratory and they're only here in the summer. Um, but we, we have a pretty good idea of which species are resident, they're here year round, which ones are migratory breeders, and which ones are just passage migrants. So those are birds that are that are just moving through. Um, but I, I don't think I'd know those numbers offhand, but it wouldn't be that hard to figure out. Okay. Um, Leanne has said thank you so much to both of you. She's already looking up tours she can book next summer. <laughs> and Donna Hardy-Cox says thank you to both Gavin and Jared. Um, and I think everyone can see that Gavin has posted in the chat that the Newfoundland and Labrador breeding bird atlas is a good source of info and the link is there. Um, I know that Gavin had answered a question from Marilyn, I think it was Marilyn, in the chat earlier because um, she was looking for guides. Gavin, would you like to answer that uh, verbally as well if you had any other kind of points about that yeah yeah uh i can't help but think that so one of the interesting thing about being a birder is it's one of the things that nobody tells you that you are one you decide to be one you're the person who decides that i'm going to be a birder so one of the questions that i asked folks is whether they uh, during my research is whether they consider themselves a birder and then what they brought with them so i have a, a great inventory of all the things that people brought with them and bird books are one of the things that people brought so people have different perspectives and ideas about what makes a good bird book. Um, obviously, um, uh, and I explored uh, this in a little more detail. So uh, my, I would just say that people have personal preferences and what's one good bird book for one person isn't gonna be a good bird book for another. Um, I like bird books that are small enough that you can bring with you and, and use in the field, like true field guides. Um, and so I usually uh, offer the Sibley guide um, as a good choice, but it might be a bit advanced for people. Uh, or the National Geographic guide is, is a good choice. Uh, Peterson's guide is a classic choice. And one of the nice things about the Peterson's guide is that um, if you're starting out, um, it, it, it'll, it'll point out key identification features that differentiate a bird's one bird species from another. So it's helpful that way. But honestly, since um, I've started carrying my phone around 
probably for over 10 years now, my favorite guide has been the one that I can carry in my pocket. And I always have my phone with me and I um, use that bird guide. And I, it's a Sibley's guide that I use on my phone uh, because it's so accessible, easy to find. And um, uh, the uh, without going into two, I will, I'll, I'll just quickly uh, clue it up. Um, Birders, as they begin to identify birds, want to start being able to identify birds by ears. That's something that all the people that I spoke with, um, all the birders that I spoke with, that's something that they wanted to do better. They wanted to be better identifiers by ear. And I find that um, uh, when you have a, a bird guide on your phone, it often comes with the recordings of the birds. And so um, it's, it's a great way to build that, um, that skill as well. Great, great answer. Uh, we do have a new question from Barry. I don't know if you can both see that, but he's asked, He's saying, I'm a senior and there seems to be more gulls and crows than decades ago. Is that correct? And do they impact negatively, uh, impact other populations negatively? And what's the human impact? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know what, what data is out there to, to sort of suggest, you know, using actual numbers if the crow and gull population has increased in recent years. Um, but you hear sort of anecdotally through people that it, it may have. Um, it's certainly, those are two species that have um, adapted well to living alongside humans. Um, so in places like like close to civilization, especially around St. John's where you have a, a large landfill and those kinds of things, the populations of those two, those two types of birds, crows, ravens, um, and gulls are sort of artificially higher because they actually do well uh, next to people. So living in, in St. John's area, you probably will have noticed in recent years those numbers going up. Um, I'm not sure that those that they particularly have an impact negatively on other populations in those cases, but uh, but yeah, it's it's certainly a, it's certainly a, a region specific, um, I think, change. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't think we have any more questions. Going once, going twice. Anyone? I see nothing out there. So we are just wrapping up now. I mean, it's almost two o'clock. Hard to believe. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to thank uh, both Dr. Watson and uh, Dr. Clark again for taking the time to uh, share their knowledge with us. Any final words either of you want to um, impart? No, um, all I would say is uh, you don't have you don't you don't have to be getting into a car and necessarily going anywhere to start watching birds. Um, like Jared said, you could walk five minutes down your street and probably find a space where you'll find bird species that you haven't seen before, or you can take steps to observe birds from your backyard. Um, I would simply say that um, it's one great way to start noticing um, the natural world around you and make connections. So there's there's nothing wrong with watching birds as far as I'm concerned. So so don't hesitate to start out. No, and, and I just wanna echo, I think that is the most important thing about birding is that it's, it's something anybody can do. You can enjoy it at your own level, whether that's uh, from the comfort of your kitchen window to globe trotting around the world, doing birding trips. Like, you know, there's so many ways to enjoy birding and there's something there for everyone. Um, and uh, the other thing I just I'll, I'll just throw out there is that if people do have other questions or you ever feel like you want to contact me with questions about birds, uh, I'm always happy to talk birds. So if even if you have a, a photo of a bird you can't identify, feel free to, to track me down and, and send it along. And I'm always happy to to chat. That's awesome. Uh, so if you enjoyed today's event, uh, please check out our alumni website for upcoming for other events, including uh, our upcoming Mun Alum Days in October and our next Coastlines Book Club event, which will be with uh, Lisa Moore on October the 27th. And as I indicated earlier, this session has been recorded and I will be sharing the link to that in an upcoming email. So please keep an eye, an eye on your inbox. And thank you once again for everyone uh, for joining and we will see you uh, next time.